right, welcome back, bug nerds. Uh, today, I wanted to do another introduction to insect taxonomy and identification, although I am planning on jumping around a bit. Uh, remember to like and subscribe. It helps the channel out a lot. It helps me out a lot. And also remember to comment. I like to talk to you guys, and uh, sometimes you guys have something really interesting to contribute. Some of you have a lot of uh, experience with insects that uh, you can share with others that uh, is, I can't cover always, especially in groups that I'm not super familiar with or groups that I haven't personally worked with. Uh, some of those groups you guys have worked with, and it's uh, really helpful for you to contribute. And uh, speaking of comments, today I wanted to talk about something that I got a comment on. So uh, someone had left a comment asking about identifying insect galls because they um, were interested in them and they had been collecting them or trying to identify them. So I figured I'd talk a little bit about insect galls and gall formers today. So uh, first, as I want to do a brief intro and then we'll get to more specifics. But most galls um, are formed by a group called the cynipids, which are a group of wasps. And that's what I wanted to talk about today, the cynipidae. Um, but as a general kind of introduction, so this is a gall. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about galls. Uh, let me make this a little bigger. Um, and galls are not, you know, random tumorous growths, which uh, you may have seen these and you may not have actually known what you were looking at. Um, so these are kind of growths that are made up of plant tissue, usually uh, caused by a presence of some sort of parasite. So these are most often found on leaves, but not always. You can kind of see here, this one looks like it's um, protruding from a stem, a branch here off of a tree. I would say, I don't know, 90% of the time when you find them, they are attached to a leaf of some kind, and they are frequently attached to uh, the leaves of dicots specifically. So dicots are a group of plants. Uh, there you have the monocotyledons and the dicotyledons. The dicots are the dicotyledons. Uh, the monocots are kind of the grasses and their relatives. The dicots tend to be trees and shrubs. Um, that is not to say that all woody things are dicots. There are monocots that look like trees, and there are dicots that look uh, kind of soft and herbaceous. But generally speaking, the dicots uh, are the trees. So you will t tend to find these galls on the leaves of trees is the most common way. You will find them at other places, but uh, this is just kind of the overview. Like I said, they're usually caused by parasites. In our case, we're gonna be talking about insects, but in the world of arthropods, it can be insects or mites. Um, frequently, you know, there are galls that are not caused by those things. There are bacterial galls, viral galls, fungal galls, nematode galls, uh, root galls are frequently caused by nematodes. There's all sorts of things, or root cysts is kind of like a gall. Um, but in the world of insects, uh, the things that can cause gall formations are wasps, flies, caterpillars, aphids, scale insects, uh, psyllid insects, and uh, sometimes weevils. Um, and I'm sure there's also some other things, but these are the most common groups. Galls are not random. So these aren't just like random swellings, although if you were to, uh, you know, talk about these technically, it is kind of like a hyperplasia um, and a hypertrophy, but it's not random. Galls are intentional. They are intentionally caused by insects, and there is an internal formation. So if you were to cut this thing open, the tissue would be layered in, usually the tissue would be layered in a very structured way. There would be lignin in some layers. Some of the layers, especially the internal layers, would be soft. The outer layers uh, would be very hard, usually, for protection of the inner layers. Um, and the tissue formation is extremely predictable. This isn't just, you know, a random hy hypertrophy of cells. Uh, the, the insects that are causing this are initiating it on purpose, and they are initiating it for some purpose, some purposeful end. Um, and generally speaking, in the center of one of these galls is where the parasite that we're talking about lives, and it will feed on the soft inner tissue layers, and it grows within this gall, and it uses the gall as protection. Um, so they are very, very predictable in form and appearance, and I have lots of pictures that we'll go through later. This is just kind of the intro. 
Galls are very, very predictable in form and appearance. Um, they are variable across species. So like um, sometimes there's variability if one sort of gall forming insect can attack multiple hosts, there'll be differences between the hosts. And there will be differences in like the gall of a wasp and the gall of an aphid. But all of the galls formed, let's say, by a site of a certain species of cynific wasp on a certain species of oak will all look the same. Um, and it, it develops in a in a predictable way. In fact, when you're attempting to identify a gall forming insect, it is easier to identify the insect by what gall it forms than by trying to identify uh, the insect by looking at it. So if you were to capture a cynipid wasp, in, in our case, uh, the cynipid wasps frequently look very similar to each other, uh, and they can be very, very hard to identify. They're very, very small. It's actually easier to just um, look at the plant that you, that you are interested in, that the gall is forming on, uh, so you know what kind of plant you have, you know what the gall looks like, uh, you can dissect the gall and see it, what its how its layers are formed, and you can identify the insect that caused it by its very predictable, predictable gall. Um, generally, like I said, there will be an insect on the interior unless it has al already left, and you will see like little exit holes on the gall if uh, insects that were inside have burrowed their way out. Um, Unfortunately, depending on what the insect is, sometimes they can be very, very small and very hard to find. And if you're just kind of blindly cutting through the gall, it's not uncommon to accidentally destroy the insect. Because um, they they are, you know, very... Generally, the insects that you find within these are very soft and very small. So the location, the size, and the shape and color of the gall are variable, like I said. But uh, within a species group, within, like, this species causes, attacks this tree and forms this kind of gall, it's very, very predictable. How the gall is formed is a little bit stranger. So gall formation is thought to be initiated either by chemically or um, through like uh, physical damage from this and, and a mixture of the physical damage and the chewing of the of an insect. But in the case of the cynipids, which is what I wanted to talk about today, um, maybe it's a venom uh, secreted by the adult, maybe it's a saliva, maybe it's a bacteria injected by the adult or a virus injected by the adult. It's actually not entirely sure uh, what exactly is causing the formation of each of these galls and why it's so predictable. So that's still kind of a mystery, which is really interesting, the actual um, chemical uh, initiant of this. So I wanted to talk about the cynipids. And the cynipids are a group of wasps, uh, so hymenoptera, in the, in the broader... Um, uh, intro to taxonomy that we've been doing we haven't made it to the hymenoptera yet these are the wasps and bees um, and the cynipids are a type of parasitic wasp they are the largest single group of organisms that cause uh or i should say largest single group of animals not organisms that call cause gall formations they all form galls and there's about uh 1400 species globally and growing. We haven't identified all of them. Within the US, uh, there's 750-ish uh, species, and it was spread across like 50 genera. So if you are not familiar with the Hymenoptera, there are three major groups of wasps, uh, wasps and bees. So the most primitive are the Symphyta, which are the sawflies. If you've never seen a sawfly, they tend to attack trees, um, and they have this broad uh, fat wa uh, waist, they generally have kind of uh, stubbier antennae sometimes, or straight antennae. They don't have like the geniculate sort of elbowed antennae that you find in uh, ants and a lot of wasps. But they are easily identified by this sort of uh, stubby waist. So most wasps and bees, you know, they have the broad thorax, and then it gets really, really thin, the petiole, and then you have like a, a big uh, abdomen with a stinger on it. Uh, the symphyta don't have that. The next groups... Um, you have the aculeates, which you are familiar with. These are the bees and the ants, and then the wasps that you're familiar with that sting, sting people, basically. Um, and these are things like the hornets and the paper wasps and stuff like that. So pretty much everyone, when they think of wasps, they think of the aculeata. The parasitica is another, probably the largest group of um, insect, or large, possibly the largest group of insects on Earth. Uh, because of the parasitic wasp, because they're made of 
parasitoid wasps than parasitic wasps. So uh, the go-to with this is like the ichneumons. These are the wasps that lay their eggs inside caterpillars and then the caterpillars burst forth. Um, they're frequently used for biological control, but that group is where the cynipids are. They are plant parasites. So the cynipids are in here, like I said, 1,400 species worldwide, pretty diverse in the U.S. with, with over 750 species described. Um, and this is kind of how they look. I, I wanted, I have photos of them, but I wanted to do a drawing because it's kind of an idealized version. They do have this uh, waste effect. So their, uh, their waste does shrink. They have this petiole effect um, where their abdomen shrinks down in the middle. Dorsally, you can see two abdominal uh, segments. There's one here and one here. And then all of their other abdominal segments are kind of telescoped on the uh, telescopic on the back of the abdomen. So they have a very distinctive abdominal shape. And the abdomen tends to be like kind of bulbous. Frequently they have this offset stinger. Um, their wings have very, very simple venation. So these cross veins here are the wings and I have kind of a, an idealized drawing here. It's a terrible drawing, but uh, they don't have very many wing, uh, wing veins. Their uh, wings tend to be much more membranous than uh, like the larger wasp groups, like wasps and bees. And it's just a couple veins um, for support. So you don't have a ton of, of venation, very, very um, simple. Their antennae tend to be pretty simple and straight. Um, and it's a very distinctive look to them. The other thing that they have uh, with their tarsi, which is kind of diagnostic, their first tarsal segment is as long as the next two combined or sometimes longer. Um, so that's kind of a strange thing for wasps. So this is what a cynipid looks like. And if again, if you go to those tarsal segments, uh, this is one and then two and three. So you can see that one is really long and two and three are, are much shorter. Uh, straight and tenny, very simple wing venation. They have this, again, uh, one, two, and then all the other segments are telescopically kind of smashed in underneath. Um, very, very simple body shape. And again, another one. Uh, this one's much darker, unfortunately, but you can still see uh, some of those characteristics. You have the uh, first tarsal segment is long. The next two are short. Straight and tenny. Oh, the other thing with the cynipids, it's, it's very distinctive in their body shape they tend to have this humpback effect um, where they have this overdeveloped sort of musculature on their uh, prothorax onto their mesothorax here. Uh, so even with the illustration, you can kind of see the humpback effect there. Uh, this cynipid has the humpback. This one has a very clear humpback effect. Um, and then you have the first abdominal segment, second, and then this one looks like it's uh, kind of pushing it out its abdomen some more. So it's not as telescopically smashed in. Reproduction in these guys is usually done uh, parthenogenically. So parthen parthenogenesis is an asexual method of reproduction where females basically can fertilize their own eggs and give birth to kind of clonal daughters. Um, and they either go through this entirely uh, parthenoge parthenogenesis or they will alternate between asexual and sexual reproduction where one generation will be all females and then the next generation will uh, there will be a few males to mix up the gene pool a little bit. Um, and then they will tend to then deposit their eggs inside these galls. For the cynipids, most of the galls are formed in oak, oaks and beaches uh, as far as trees, although you will find them on other things. Um, but it is, I want to say it's like 70% of them attack oak trees. Like it's very, very uh, strange that way. Again, here's another cynipid. This one has a very distinct body shape. So hump back. Uh, uh, this Andricus, uh, very straight and tenny. You have the first tarsal segment followed by two, uh, two and three, which are very, very small. You have this kind of displaced ovipositor. So you have one and two with the uh, dorsal abdominal segments. And then you have the kind of the, all the other segments telescopically underneath. Very, very simple wing structure. So very, very obvious sort of body shape that is associated with the cynipids. What is interesting about it, this one, uh, Andricus, Quercus californicus. So this is California oak. Quercus is oak, and which is really useful to know uh, when you're talking about the cynipids. This is what their galls look like, and they're absolutely huge. They're called oak apple galls, and they do get about the size of a small apple. They get absolutely enormous. They grow out of the uh, tree uh, branch. 
but this is uh, what you will see. And when I was growing up, people would say like, oh, those are spider's eggs, or those are um, tumors on the plants, or those are fungal things. And that's not what they are. These are, these are frequently wasp balls. These are the ones that I grew up seeing all the time. You have uh, this sort of speckled gall forming on um, a tree leaf. And you, I am sure, have seen these before when you've been like raking leaves or something. Um, again, if you're picking oak, if you're like picking up oak leaves or something, you might find these big masses on the central veins of the oak leaves. These are uh, Cynippus divisa. So these are just more and more of these, um, these galls. Sometimes the galls look different. They're not huge balls. Sometimes they're just really, really small, sort of swollen areas along the veins of leaves. Uh, they come in a lot of different shapes and uh, sizes. But also we have uh, a kind of very strange looking galls. So this is these are again um, oak galls caused by these cynipid wasps. These I have seen before. Uh, this one, I although this particular species is European. Um, but sometimes they are very, very fuzzy. Uh, the ones that I used to see all the time used to be these big, fuzzy, almost acorn-looking balls uh, on oak trees. I should just pull it up. I actually, I want to show you how you can do some identifications on these. But they come in a lot of different um, shapes and sizes. Again, these aren't on leaves. These are actually growing directly out of the stem. But again, another oak, um, oak marble gall. And so you might be thinking, well, okay, now I know what a gall is. I know what a sign up it is. How do I identify that? So you it's easier like i said to identify the galls than try to identify these very very small cynipid wasps cynipids tend to be just a couple millimeters long um so they can be very very hard to see but there are websites that will tell you how to identify um galls so this website is called gallformers.org and i will link these websites in the description if you are interested in them um the thing that you have to remember with these galls uh, gall identification is you have to know the host plant. So if you're just like looking at a tree and you don't know what kind of tree it is, um, it's going to be kind of difficult. So you go up here to identify. And the first thing it's going to ask you is what is the host? Um, what is the host plant? So there's genus and genus subsection here, and next to it, you can't really see it here. It will ask specifically for the host. I'm going to put in Quercus, uh, Quercus alba. So this is white oak, and then it will just show you all of the kinds of galls that occur on white oak, and it will tell you what the causative agent is. Um, and because galls across species are, uh, or, or galls within a species on a host plant are very, very uh regular you should be able to figure out what the gall is from here there is another website that you can use for gall identification as well so again these are just the galls that form on white oaks there's just so many kinds of galls uh but there is a if you go to iNaturalist uh which is a great site for the identification of all sorts of things uh, they have a section on gall identification and again you need to know what kind of um host you're dealing with. So is it an oak, a willow, uh, creosote, all sorts of things. So you need to be able to identify the plant that you're working on. Uh, so first thing is if you have a yard full of trees with galls, what kind of trees do you have? If you know it's an oak, that's a good starting point, but you might want to get pick up like a, a field guide for identification of your local trees and figure out what species of oak it is. And you, you can figure that out from, you know, even if it's in the winter, you can figure that out just from the, the branches. Um, and the bud formations and things like that. So you are you don't have to wait for the summer or something like that. Uh, so with that, I'm going to kind of end the talk on cynipids there. Hopefully that helped. Um, and some of you are now more interested in gall formers. And I'll talk to you guys later.